Sweden. Greetings and peace. This is Dr. Lawrence Brown coming to you with yet another episode. We have been discussing the evidences for the prophethood of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. In this episode, going to discuss the fifth section of this discussion. You'll forgive me if I have to deal with this a little bit superficially. We originally designed this talk for two sections, but it has come out to five already. I continue this point, however. I just want to conclude by saying that as polygamy is permitted in the Holy Quran, it is limited to four, and there are limits placed upon the relationship and the rights of women. We have to remember that the Old Testament permitted polygamy. It was only outlawed amongst Ashkenazi Jews in the year 1000. It was only outlawed in Israel in 1950. So the fact of the matter is that the Old Testament recognized and permitted polygamy without limit. In the same way, the New Testament did not specifically condone polygamy, but on the other hand, it did not forbid it. Having said that, the revelation that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam conveyed for the first time in history um, required women to be respected and gave them their rights. They had to be married with necessary formality. And 1,300 years before the developed West, gave women their rights to inheritance, their rights to property, their rights to wealth, their rights to religion. Islam gave these rights to women in the 600s when Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam revealed the revelation of the Holy Quran. Another point that should be made is that even until this time, the church debates about whether or not women have souls. And yet Islam recognized that women had souls equal to men. And this recognition was 1,400 years ago. To this day, it remains behind closed doors because it is a politically sensitive issue. But the church still debates over whether or not women have souls. So I will conclude this uh, category of the evidence with Thomas Carlyle's quotation as thus, quote, Muhammad himself, after all that can be said about him, was not a sensual man. We shall err widely if we consider this man as a common voluptuary intent mainly on base enjoyments, nay, on enjoyments of any kind. His household was of the frugalist, his common diet, barley bread and water. Sometimes for months there was not a fire once lighted on his hearth. They record with just pride that he would mend his own clothes, patch his own cloak. A poor, hard-toiling, ill-provided man, careless of what vulgar men toil for. Vulgar in Old English meaning common. Careless of what vulgar or common men toil for. Not a bad man, I should say. Something better in him than hunger of any sort. For these wild Arab men fighting and jostling three and twenty years at his hand in close contact with him always would not have reverenced him so. They were wild men, bursting ever and anon into quarrel, into all kinds of fierce sincerity, without right worth and manhood. No man could have commanded him. And yet, command him, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did, and he did so through his character and through conveying a revelation that he did not compromise for the base enjoyments of this life. The next category in this discussion is maintenance of message, meaning that we expect to find in the example of a prophet the maintenance of the core message of what it means to be a person of God. Again, we are discussing the evidences for the prophethood of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and I submit that one of the evidences is that he maintained the message of truth in Revelation. To understand this, we have to remember that the core message of Revelation truly never changed. 
Islamic monotheism teaches that God is one. We find, if we step back, we find in the Old Testament, we find the first commandment is to recognize the unity of God. We find in the New Testament that Jesus Christ is asked three places about the greatest commandment and he states, Know, O Israel, the Lord thy God, the Lord is one. The Trinity is not based on the teachings of Jesus Christ. The Trinity was a derived doctrine derived from extra-biblical sources and attributed to the foundational teachings of Paul and Pauline theologians. The teaching of the prophet Jesus was the teaching of Tawhid, of the oneness of God. We find in three places in the Bible he spoke of the oneness of God and never spoke of the Trinity. Charges which you can find again explained in far greater detail either in earlier sessions of these talks or in my book, Misguided. So, the essential creed, in other words, never changed. The laws taught by Moses and Jesus were transmitted with little variation. Little variation? That's a concerning phrase, isn't it? Little variation means that there were some changes, and indeed there were. In the time of Moses and Jesus, alcohol may have been permitted, and in the Islamic religion it was forbidden. And there were other changes as well, few and albeit small, but significant changes, such as the abolition of the Sabbath. However, we have to consider whether this makes sense in the scheme of Revelation. Because, in fact, we find the example of abrogation, the example in which God changed his laws according to time and circumstance. For example, God initially permitted the sons and daughters of Adam to marry. It was a necessity. The human race sprung from their ancestry. But this, of course, was later recognized as incest. And when the human race had developed to a stage at which it did not need to be incestuous in order to propagate the race, it was forbidden. We find that at one time a man could marry two sisters, but later this was forbidden. We find in one of the fastest reversals of Revelation that Abraham was commanded to sacrifice his son, but then relieved of the duty. So abrogation is not something that occurred just in the Holy Quran or just in the New Testament or just in the Old Testament. In fact, according to the human condition, Allah adjusted the laws as needed. In the case of alcohol, the Islamic understanding is that mankind was not ready in its earlier stages to accept the prohibition on alcohol, that this would have been too difficult upon them that they would not have been able to maintain the commandment. It was not until later that the commandment could be given because the people could actually live by that commandment. Hence, that commandment was delayed until the Islamic revelation. Similarly, in the other examples that I mentioned, you can understand the sense for having delayed those prohibitions until the stages of revelation at which they were appropriate. Now, it is odd to hear objections from the Christian quarter in this regard. Why? Well, because Jesus Christ is recorded in Matthew as having stated that he did not come to destroy the prophets or the law, but to fulfill. And he went on to say that not one jot, not one tittle shall change from the law until all be fulfilled. He went on to clarify till heaven and earth shall pass, etc., etc. The Christian claim is that the law is canceled by the concept of justification by faith. So we have Christians claiming that they cannot accept the fact that Islamic law abrogates some of their laws, but on the other hand, the Christians abrogated the entire Mosaic law with their concept of justification by faith. And we'll take a break right now and come back to that thought in just a few minutes. Please stay with us. Islam, Islam is a way of life, a complete way. Welcome back. This is Dr. Lawrence Brown continuing this episode 
where we are discussing the evidences for the prophethood of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I left off discussing the fact that Christians may claim that they have a problem understanding how the laws of the Holy Quran abrogate some of their laws. For example, alcohol is permitted in the New Testament, alcohol is forbidden in the Holy Quran. And I was just saying this is a very bizarre claim to come from their perspective because the Christian religion has taken the Old Testament law and canceled it on the premise of justification by faith, saying that you can be forgiven of all things if you just believe in the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Whereas Jesus Christ taught Old Testament law, he was known for this as Rabbi Jesus. He was an Orthodox Jew. That was the code he lived by. That was the law he professed in multiple passages in the New Testament. The fact is that Jews have abrogated not part of Old Testament law, but all of it. And yet, they have a problem with the Holy Quran abrogating the law regarding alcohol. It's a very disingenuous claim. At the same time, Christians effectively argue that not just the law changed, but the essence of God himself, that God transformed from the wrathful God of the Old Testament to the merciful God of the New Testament. So the claim is basically, you claim that alcohol is forbidden? Well, that's just ridiculous. Okay, we have changed the essence and nature of God, and we have canceled all previous laws, but we can't believe that just this one law has been abrogated. That is a pretty insincere thing to say. So we can easily understand that there may have been a few changes in the laws. The restrictions of the Sabbath might have been lifted. The permissibility of alcohol might have been annulled. But for the most part, we find that the laws of the Old Testament are intact through the course of the teachings of Moses, the teachings of Jesus Christ, and the teachings and revelation that was transmitted by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa In the same way, we find that the creed has not changed. As the Old Testament declared in the first commandment that know your God is one God, Jesus Christ taught the same message three places in the New Testament, that your God is one God, and the Holy Quran declares divine unity. Not only declares divine unity, but condemns the Trinity. So we find preservation of the message of the prophets, okay? not of the doctrines. And it's important to understand the difference because different churches have corrupted the doctrines of Christianity to pattern their doctrines after the teachings, not of Jesus Christ, but the teachings of Paul. And we have discussed this in previous episodes. It is well outlined in my writings on my website, in my books, which I will mention shortly. But all of these statements are backed by evidence and fact. So, what do we find in that case? We find that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not cancel or change the creed of the Jews or the Christians, but rather maintained it. Now, what is important about this is that he did not compromise the creed according to the teachings of Jesus Christ to satisfy those who had already compromised it. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is although he maintained the true teachings of previous prophets, teaching that God is one, as Moses and Jesus taught, this was not what most Christians at the time believed. Most Christians at the time believed in the Trinity. Remember, this was 640. 650, 660 CE, whereas the Trinity had been canonized in 325. So many Christians, if not most, were believing in the Trinity. They were professing mysteries of faith. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam transmitted a revelation which supported the true teachings of Jesus Christ, not the corruptions of the doctrines that had been derived by the Trinitarian Church. Now, that is significant why? That is significant because a false prophet would have been seeking to build up a congregation. And how do you build up a congregation? You give them what they want. You give them more of what they already have. 
They are believing that God is one but three in one. You tell them the same thing. They are believing that Christ will return. You tell them that you are Christ returned. All of these things, you give them what they want. You don't give them what you want. What is the example of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? He gave them what God wanted. He gave them what had been revealed to Moses, he gave them what had been revealed to Jesus, and he gave them a revelation that supported the creed that had been revealed to those previous prophets. Yes, there were some abrogations in the law, but they were few and far between. And the bottom line is that a charlatan would have built up his congregation not by giving a revelation that is contrary to what people believe, not by correcting people, but by giving them what they want. What do we expect from the example of a true prophet? We expect a true prophet to correct deficiencies, correct matters in which people have gone astray, and guide them back to the religion of Allah's design. And that is the example we find in the person of Muhammad, peace be upon him. So. Let us remember the story in Matthew 22:14 that concludes with the teaching, for many are calling, but few are chosen. We find that many are exposed to these truths, but few embrace them. In one case, I would like to quote from how the Muslims represented their faith to the king of Abyssinia, a Christian king, who inquired after their beliefs. They stated as follows, quote, O king of Abyssinia, we used to be a people of ignorance, worshiping idols, eating dead animals, performing indecencies, casting off family bonds, doing evil to our neighbors, and the strong among us would eat the weak. Thus remained our common trait until God sent us a messenger. We knew his ancestry, his truthfulness, his trustworthiness, and his chastity. He called us to Allah that we might worship him alone and forsake all that which we have been worshiping other than him of these stone and idol. He commanded us to be truthful in speech, to keep our trusts, to strengthen our family ties, to be good to our neighbors, to avoid the prohibitions and blood, and to avoid all indecencies, lying, theft of the orphans, money, and the slander of chaste women. He further commanded us to worship Allah alone, not associating anything in worship with him. He commanded us to pray, pay charity, and fast. So we believed in him, accepted his message, and followed him in that which he received from Allah, worshiping Allah alone, not associating any partners with him, refraining from all prohibitions and accepting all that which was made permissible for us. Well, the Christian king of Abyssinia, upon hearing the statement, declared what? Did he declare, gee, we never heard that message before. No, he declared that this was the message of the prophet Jesus Christ, recognizing that Muhammad's revelation and example, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, maintained the true message of Allah, the true message of God. The Christian king of Abyssinia sheltered the Muslims, and the tradition relates that he himself embraced Islam. To conclude, I am going to quote, not from a Muslim source, but from Alphonse de Limartin, one of the most famous historians of all time. He stated as follows in speaking of Muhammad, peace be upon him. His life, his meditations, his heroic revilings against the superstitions of his country, and his boldness in defying the furies of idolatry his firmness in enduring them for 15 years at Mecca, his acceptance of the role of public scorn and almost of being a victim of his fellow countrymen, 
All these and finally his flight, his preaching, his wars against odds, his faith in his success and his superhuman security in misfortune, his forbearance in victory, his ambition, which was entirely devoted to one idea and in no manner striving for an empire, his endless prayers, his mystic conversations with God, his death and his triumph after death, all these attest not to an imposture, but to a firm conviction, which gave him the power to restore, to restore dogma. This dogma was twofold, the unity of God and the immateriality of God, the former telling us what God is, the latter telling what God is not, the one overturning, overthrowing false gods with the sword, the other starting an idea with the words. Philosopher, orator, apostle, legislator, warrior, conqueror of ideas, restorer of rational dogmas, of a cult without images, the founder of 20 terrestrial empires and of one spiritual empire, that is Muhammad. As regards all standards, by which human greatness may be measured, we may well ask, is there any man greater than he? This is Dr. Lawrence Brown concluding this episode. Inshallah, we will continue next time. Until then, I bid you peace. Do you know what Islam is? It's a